Good morning, everybody. It's great to be with all of you. Now it's、uh, four in the afternoon for me right now, so I'm awake.、Um, but I appreciate you getting up early and coming to the early service.、Um, one second, let me plug in.、Uh, before we jump into this, the name of the lesson today is Love Letter.、Um, thank you, Tony, for the warm introduction.、Uh, my name is Sean. I was born in Kansas,、uh, but、uh, I ended up in the Soviet Union. Um, and I'll share about that in a second. But it is great to be here in South Florida. You're very blessed、uh, to have this、uh, not only beautiful part of the world to live in, but also the, the amazing leadership God has blessed you with.、Uh, we would often,、uh, probably at least once every couple of weeks, we would watch your worship service in Odessa, Ukraine. And we would sing along with your group because、um, your group is really awesome. So it was great to be able to be here live for your worship this morning. Um, and I don't know about the public speaking thing.、Uh, my speaking is not actually all that great, and my English isn't that great. I think all languages are a second language for me now.、Um, I have no first language.、Uh, I actually wanted to be a doctor,、uh, but when I went pre med, they told me I had to take a foreign language in a public speaking class, so I changed majors <laughs>、uh, because foreign language is impossible and public speaking. Is impossible for me. So I switched to being an engineer because that was the only thing that didn't make me take public speaking in a foreign language. So now I professionally butcher two languages all the time.、Um, but God's word is awesome and it can change any of us. Amen.、Um, this is my family.、Uh, that's me and、uh, my wife, Lena. She was the 104th baptism of the Moscow Church of Christ. Um, and that's my daughter, Diana, in the middle, and my son, Andrew.、Uh, they're coming to the 11 o'clock service.、Uh, they just successfully got into a car.、Uh, so they'll be here at 11 for that.、Um, so, amen. That's awesome. That's good news.、Uh, this is the, the team that planted the church in Kiev in 1992.、Um, a small group of people, and we didn't speak the language, and,、uh, but we just went out and loved people and shared our hearts. And this is a picture of the Kiev church now. So, God has definitely blessed it. I've spent、uh, 29 of my 52 years now overseas. So,、uh, I've been more of my life on the mission field than here.、Uh, but it's always nice to come home because we miss Chipotle and Chick fil A. So,、um, it's always good to come home.、Uh, this is my wife again.、Uh, we basically, four years ago,、uh, handed off the Kiev church to a new lead evangelist and to a new eldership. Um, because me and my wife are actually、uh, taking care of、uh, 21 different countries in Eastern Europe.、Um, and in the Ukraine,、uh, God is really blessed, and there's the large church in Kiev and several other churches in the Ukraine. But most of the other countries have tiny churches of 20 to 40 members、uh, that have never really taken root、uh, to really evangelize their countries. So we've decided to pack up our bags.、Uh, we left our daughter at home. She's now an empty nester and kicked her parents out of the house. Um, and she's her sophomore year, sophomore year in college.、Um, but we are now going to spend the next 10 years of our lives hitting all the different countries in Eastern Europe and bringing a team with us of volunteers, of empty nesters, college grads, high school grads, anyone who wants to come spend 10 months on the mission field with us to help us turn the country around for Christ and really set it up so that it can then plant other churches and, and go to different places. So this last year, Uh, we packed up、uh, a year and a half ago and decided to go to Budapest, Hungary for the first adventure.、Uh, and this is the team we gathered 21 people. We met on Zoom for three months before we launched. And、uh, three or four days before we were supposed to launch to Hungary,、uh, COVID shut down the borders to Hungary. So we couldn't land in Hungary. So we quickly, over the next three days, came up with a new plan to go to Odessa, Ukraine, then to Hungary.、Uh, and then once we got all of, the, all of the logistics set up for that, The doors shut down to Odessa as well. And the only country we could land in was Turkey, Istanbul, which is 99% Muslim. So the team re, re, what's the word in English? Rerouted again and landed in Istanbul, Turkey,、uh, for three weeks before the door opened to get to Odessa. We finally got to Odessa.、Uh, here's the team. We've been there for 10 months and we just finished last month.、Um, it was an amazing time. We had four empty nesters. Uh, six people who are training to actually lead churches、uh, one day in their future lives, and 16 people who just took a year off from college, from school, from whatever, just took a break to devote themselves a whole year,、uh, 10 months basically, to serving one of these countries. And it was really, really awesome.、Um, 
So I have the next two months off, so to speak. We finished up in Odessa. We never got out of Odessa because of COVID. We actually never saw the Odessa church until our last Sunday service. Um, But we were out sharing our faith every day. Several people became Christians, inviting hundreds of people. Lots of people studied the Bible. It was very encouraging and inspiring. Uh, But uh, August 28th, we head for Zagreb, Croatia. Um, And then the next year, I think we're either going to Romania or Slovakia. And then the next year, we're going to go to Athens, Greece. So if you're thinking you want to take a year and give it to the Lord, um, sign up. We'd be fired up to have you. Um, It's been an amazing experience. But let's jump into... And if you want to follow me, that's my Instagram and Facebook um, if you're interested in more information. But let's open the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Okay. Hebrews 4. So this, we're going to talk about God's love letter. And you know, when you look at the Bible, it really is God's love letter. If there's anything you hear me say today, I want you to hear God loves you. God loves you. That incredible book that you can open up right now is living proof that God loves you. Hebrews 4, 12 through 13. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. The word of God is unbelievable. Uh, Living and active. You know, it doesn't matter what you've How many times you've read a certain verse in the Bible, there's times you can read it the 10th or 15th time and it hits you totally different. It's it's like, you know, being married for 27 years. You think you know the person completely, but... And you're like, whoa, I didn't see that coming. And it's like, you know, it's, it's like the Word of God, right? It's a living, active relationship. It's not just a book. It, it's, it's like, you know, Narnia. It looks like, it looks like a wardrobe, but you go in it and there's this whole world on the other side. The Bible is exactly like that. No matter what situation you're in, and, and I know in the last year and a half, we've been in some crazy situations. No matter what situation you're in, the Word of God is alive and exactly what you need to hear right now. Whether you're a teen or whether you just retired, whether you're campus, whether you're single, whether you're married, uh, whether you're American, Russian, Ukrainian, no matter what color your skin is, the exact thing you need to hear today is the Word of God. It's the Word of God. It can totally change our lives. Amen? Amen? Now, when I was younger, this is a long time ago. Um, When I wanted to know what I needed to do when I was a kid, I would shake an eight ball. Now, if you have no idea what that is, basically you shake this eight ball, you flip it up and it gives you the answer. Like, will this girl ever like me? No, never. Okay, let me try again. No, never. Okay. So, you, you know, like I'm trying to figure out what to do with my life and I'm hoping this eight ball will tell me what to do. Now, this new generation, we have Google. And often whenever we have questions about anything, we just Google it. Um, but I, I want to tell you, Nobody has the answers like God's Word. Google does not know how to fix what's going on in your life. Google doesn't know how to take care of your soul and your heart and your life. It doesn't know how to fix a marriage. It doesn't know how to build great... Google is not the answer. God's Word is the answer. Amen? I was an atheist. And nine months after being an atheist, I was signed up to go to the former Soviet Union on a mission team. How does that happen? It was reading God's word that totally changed the way I view everything. It says here, it's sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit. So we have a dog, his name's Kaksik. That means like cupcake, I think, in Russian. But dogs are funny because at some moments I feel like he's just really loyal to me. But as soon as somebody says the word cheese or says the word park, or if there's a cuter dog walking around, I lose his attention immediately. It's like his natural instincts kick in and and the loyalty's kind of gone. You know, I don't know about how you felt the last year and a half, but there have been moments where I'm really struggling with fear or concern or I'm getting upset or things are happening and I feel like I'm starting to feel things I know I shouldn't feel. And the Bible's capable of separating kind of our human instincts or our natural tendencies or our sinful nature or whatever you want to call it. It separates that and helps us to be spiritual. 
It's the word of God that does that. You can test this out. You can, you can go on Facebook and just read news on Facebook for two hours and then check how you're feeling inside. Or open up the book of Acts and just read the first 15 chapters of the book of Acts without a break. And then ask yourself how you feel. See, the word of God, sometimes we feel like it's all stuck, you know, all confused, and it's all, it's inseparable. But the word of God can get in there and help you to be spiritual. And we need spirituality at this hour. Amen, church. We need to not think like this world thinks. We need to think the way God thinks. Amen. Now it says also that, that, the, that the word of God is, is able to separate joints and marrow. Now, as you guys know, we have bones, and that's like our skeleton. That, that holds us together. Without, without a skeleton, without some kind of structure, we'd be a blob. Inside your bones is bone marrow, and I, I know you probably know this, but in your bone marrow every day, about 240 billion new cells are produced a day. Inside the bone is your marrow, and that's where life comes from. It's life. It, it regenerates. It repro- it, you, you, your life is coming from your marrow. Imagine some writer in the first century talking about separating the bone from the marrow, the life from the structure. See, we need structure. We need to know church is at nine or it's at 11. We have midweeks, we have small groups. We need the skeleton to stand up and move around and function. We need, we need structure. But the structure alone will not produce the life. You could come into this meeting and and have one of the best life-changing experiences you've ever had, or you could come in and just kind of check it off and leave and go home. And it actually has nothing to do with how good the worship is or the sermon. It has so much to do with just how the Word of God is functioning in your life right now. It separates the bone from the marrow. It gives you the life and the passion for what you do. Amen, church? The Word of God is what returns that. And I don't know about you, but I've spent several times in my 30-some years as a Christian where it was more of a a structure thing keeping me in in the game as opposed to a passion keeping me in the game. But it's not a mystery why it's structure or why it's passion. It's the Word of God every time. If you're in the Word of God, there's passion happening in your Christianity. If you're not in the Word of God, then it's probably the structure holding you in. But it won't forever. Amen, church? Church can be boring. Um, I like Mr. Bean. Um, But church church isn't a building And actually, church isn't even a meeting. It's a group of people who decided to try and be like Jesus, and you come together to do that together, to encourage each other and help each other grow in that. Amen? It's it's a lifestyle. It's, uh, you know, in, in, in this former Soviet Union, you don't really have Halloween, but you dress up in costumes on New Year's. And the last time I dressed up in a costume, I was a, I was a big pink pig. And when you dress up as a big pink pig, what do you act like? A pig, you try anyways. You try and act like a pig. If you put on a costume, you try and act out what the costume is. The Bible talks about us being clothed in Christ. So literally, when we wake up in the morning, we think, okay, today I'm gonna try and be as much like Jesus as I possibly can. And it's actually not a, a Halloween act or just a costume we put on. We actually try and live and think and act Like Jesus does. And then when we come together, that's church. That's life in Christ. We're we're in him. We're we're clothed in him. That's what church is. Amen? Amen. And I'm fired up. That's what it is. I'd be so bummed if Christianity was just something you come, listen about it, then go home for a week until you come back and listen about it again. I'm so fired up that Christianity requires full participation. Imagine how discouraging it would be if Jesus said, look, all your sins are forgiven. I just want you to come in once a week, get reminded about who I am, then go and live your lives because that's really all I need from you because I can basically take care of it all by myself. I'm glad that was not the message. Like Tony said, we actually are going to reflect Christ. We're his icon. We're, 
we're his beings on earth. We'll show who God is. We get the main role in the movie. Amen, church. So Revive was a total blast. Um, let me share a couple things. So there was a, a cafe, like a, there's like a Starbucks. We don't have Starbucks in the Ukraine, but there's a cafe, it's called Mary Berry in the, in the Ukraine. And we just decided it was kind of in the center of the city. We said, let's just take this cafe over. So what we did is we set up all of our studies in that cafe. So 20 of us out sharing our faith, inviting people to study the Bible all day long. We literally had every, after a month or so, we had every single table in the cafe with Bible studies. And then we said, you know what? We just want to all come here after church. We'll bring all of our visitors and we'll all come here after church. And I talked to the owner of Mary Berry. I said, can we just have the cafe from this time to this time after? They said, it's yours. So they blocked off the cafe, all the seats, just so everyone can come from church and do Bible studies in their cafe. So when we left, they were very discouraged. Like I got a text last week while I was in America. Where are you guys? Like what, what happened to you? When are you coming back? It's, it's Christianity. Christianity is just living together, trying to be like Jesus. I love the, the picture in the lower left-hand corner. There was a teen sister in Odessa who was 16, and for Christmas, she bought every member from the Revive team a pair of socks, Christmas socks. And then she wrote a verse on it, like bringing feet that can bring you good news or the gospel or something. And she gave everybody socks, so we took a picture showing off her socks to everybody. But it's awesome to be Christians, amen? Um, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. Let's read another verse. This connector thing kind of goes on and off. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All scripture is from God. It's, it's not like a buffet where you just kind of pick and choose the pieces you kind of like and kind of ignore the pieces you don't like. It's all from God. It's all necessary. Um, and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training. Okay, teaching. Teaching is simple. I just don't know. Like, I just didn't know the Bible when I studied the Bible. I just, there's things I'm learning from God all the time when I read my Bible. Um, then there's correcting. Um, I'm actually thankful for correction. Uh, correction helps me from going the wrong way, right? I mean, you guys have a GPS. I took a GPS to get from, uh, from wherever I was, north, wherever, down to here today. And, and the GPS a couple times said, uh, no, like turn left. And I missed it. And it's like, hmm, turn left again. And I'm so thankful it doesn't raise its voice at me. <laughs> I'm so thankful it uses the same kind tone. And you know, you can test it. You can make 15 wrong turns with, with the GPS and it'll just keep telling you, please turn left here. Please turn seven times, 77 times. Please turn left here. And the amazing thing about the GPS is that no matter what wrong turns you make, it still is going to get you to where you want to go. That's the beautiful thing about God. No matter how many times I've messed up, he still will get me back on the path towards him. No matter how many wrong turns, he keeps bringing me back to be with him. Amen? So correcting is good. Now, don't get irritated with your GPS. It's just trying to get you back to where you said you wanted to go. Training is helpful because I can understand it, but it doesn't mean I can do it. So I was, a, I was on the tennis team at the University of Kansas, and um, I would have to hit thousands of balls a day. Even though I've already hit thousands of balls, I'd hit another thousand. Why? Because just because I know it doesn't mean I can do it. Right? Um, I don't want a pilot who just knows how to land a plane. I want a pilot who's actually landed one before. Like, it, it's important to practice. Training is important. Just because we know that verse doesn't mean we're real good at, at putting it into practice. So we have to practice. We have to train. And then rebuking is important because sometimes you're just going the wrong way. And you can really damage your soul. So the Bible is very strong at times as well. The Bible is amazing. Amen? Amen. I wanted to share a story. Uh, the, the brother on the right, his name's Andrew, and he'd been a Christian for like 18 years. And that's his mom in the middle, Masha. And Masha never wanted to come to church, never wanted to go to church with Andrew, never was interested in anything to do with, with, with what Andrew was doing with his life, like zero interest. One of the sisters in the church called Andrew and said, Andrew, I just, you know, God put it on my heart. Can I just come and meet with your mom and read the Bible with her? And uh, Andrew was like, well, I'll ask her. So he said, mom, would you be open to someone just coming over and, you know, reading the Bible together?
because you know she claimed to be religious but orthodox um, and didn't really want to have anything to do with, with, with church. She said, yeah, that's fine. Have her come over and read the Bible, but I'm, I'm, ne I'm never coming to church with you. It's like, okay, just read the Bible. That's great. So the sister comes over and decides to read a bunch of verses about repentance and baptism and life changing and, and, and turning around and turning towards God. And, and they were just reading a bunch of verses. And after about 25 minutes, she said, wait a minute. And, and the sister's like, yeah. And she said, are you telling me I need to change my life and get baptized? And she's like, no, I didn't say anything. We're just reading the Bible. It's like, no, no, no. Are you telling me I need to get baptized? It's like, I... Just the Bible. You're just, we're just reading the Bible. And she's like, call my son. And she's like, uh-oh, this isn't good. This isn't good. Call the son. Like, Andrew, you need to come home. I need to get baptized. And the sister's like, oh, well, we should read some other verses too. There's, there's other parts of the Bible besides that. So they start reading the Bible and, and they start studying the Bible. And about three weeks later, Masha becomes a Christian. Amen? It was the Bible that totally changed her life. Now, about two weeks after she became a Christian, unfortunately, Masha had a stroke. And they put her in the hospital and she fell into a coma. And for two and a half days, she was laying in this coma. And after two and a half days, she wakes up from the coma. When she wakes up, there's nobody in her hospital room except a woman laying next to her. And Masha wakes up from the coma and, and looks over and sees the woman. And the woman's looking at her. And Masha, and I kid you not, Masha's first words out of her mouth were, you have to get your life right with God. And the woman's like, like, not hello, where's the doctor, where are my family, what happened to me, why am I a hospital, nothing. It was just, you have to get your life right with God. And the woman like this and said, oh, okay. And she's like, you need to study the Bible. And they started talking for about 20, 25 minutes. Then she took a rest because she was very tired and she fell back into a coma. About an hour after that, Andrew shows up at the hospital and um, the woman laying there said, hey, your mom woke up. And Andrew's like, well, what did, what did she say? What happened? What, what, what did she say? I said, well, she, she told me I need to get my life right with God and that I should study the Bible. And that really actually encouraged Andrew that after the stroke, so much God is on her heart and her mind. So about six hours later that evening, uh, Masha passed away and went on to be with God. The woman laying next to her's name is Galena. Now Galena, after watching someone wake up for 15 minutes before she died to tell her she needs to get her life right with God, took that as a serious <laughs> message. <laughs> Something that doesn't happen every day. So Galena said, I wanna study the Bible, I wanna get my life right with God. And she studied the Bible and two weeks after Masha passed, she became a Christian also, amen? If we can just give the Word of God a chance to work, if you can just get the Word of God open, no matter where you might be stuck yourself or no matter where your friends or the people around you might be stuck, the Word of God is living and active. Amen, church? Amen. Let's read another verse. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So if you don't know Jesus' teaching, you're definitely not right with God. You absolutely have to know what Jesus teaches. You have to know what he expects from our lives to even be in the realm of, of getting close to being right with God. Now, then once you know what Jesus teaches, that's actually not enough either. You actually have to hold you actually have to make an attempt to try and do what the Bible teaches, amen? We have to hold to the teachings. And if you hold to the teachings, then you'll actually know the truth. Amen. And the truth will set you free. Now, when I studied the Bible as an atheist, I wanted to know it was true before I started doing it. Hey, you, you show me this is true, I'll do it. 
You're like, no, nah, that's actually not the way the Bible works because it requires faith. You have to start doing it before you believe it's true, and then you'll know it's true. Because your relationship with God will be based on faith. Mm, all right, fine, I'll try it. <laughs> you know, I didn't like that answer, but I figured I should try it, right? But then it happens, right? Then you realize, whoa, this is actually true. This is the moment where I have a job on Wall Street, but I'd rather quit it and go on a mission team. Someone needs to wake up or I need to stop speaking. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> if it goes off in five minutes, I'm going to know that was for me. Um, hold to the teaching and then we'll know the truth and then we'll be set free. I don't know about you, but there were several moments in the last year and a half where I did not feel free. I felt enslaved to circumstance. We've had war, we've had coups, we've had economic defaults. We're on the brink of invasion. I live 45 minutes south of Chernobyl. There's a lot of things that I could get nervous about. There's a lot of things that could put me in a cage. But the Bible promises me I can be free. But I have to hold to the teachings. Amen, church? If you've got yourself in a tough place right now, hold to the teachings and it'll set you free. Amen? Amen. Last verse we're going to read. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you'll save both yourself and your hearers. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere, which means it's not simple. Because if you do, you'll save yourself and those around you. You know, Getting access to the Word of God or learning the Word of God actually doesn't just involve your salvation. Everybody around you is going to be affected by you implementing that book into your life. It, it's all connected. Um, we have to persevere and not give up holding to the Scriptures. Amen? Amen. This is a special picture for us. Um, the guy in the middle is my, my wife's dad. Now, my wife... Um, she was, like I said, 104th baptism of the Moscow church. Then about 10 years later, her grandma, 82 years old, grew up in communism, became a Christian. And then a few years after that, Lena's mom became a Christian. Then Lena's sister became a Christian. Then Lena's sister's husband became a Christian. Then their son became a Christian. And the only one who wasn't a Christian was dad. Dad was a military engineer, um, communist, atheist, didn't believe in God. And I must have studied the Bible with him five times. Started and stopped, started and stopped, started. He just, he just never, he never quite made it as a Christian. Now, thanks to COVID, um, you know, you're in a small apartment and mom's watching church on TV and you really don't have anywhere to go. I mean, it's like, <laughs> you're going to church whether you want to or not. So uh, he came to church unwillingly, maybe, but... Uh, he was watching church. He was hearing God's word. He was worshiping with God's people. Um, and he started to get interested again. So he reached out to me and said, Sean, I want to study the Bible. And in the back of my head, I was thinking, oh, this will be number six. <laughs> and I said, okay, let's do it. And we started to study the Bible and it was totally different. Oh my gosh, the word of God, he really let it into his heart and his life and it started to change him. It was the most unbelievable thing. It was an out-of-body experience. If you've ever prayed for somebody for 30 years and then they finally went to study the Bible, you know how that feels when, when you start to see them change their lives. And it was unbelievable. Just a couple months ago, Lena's dad, after 29 years of my wife praying for him, uh, got baptized, amen? We, we weren't able to fly in because of COVID. Um, but we got to be on Zoom and watch the baptism on Zoom, which was very, very inspiring. Uh, now, I do want to share one story about the fifth time I studied, the, or the fourth time I studied the Bible with him, uh, because I was living in Kiev, and I took a flight to Moscow because he said he wanted to study the Bible. Uh, so flying to Moscow is like a one-hour flight, um, which is not difficult, very quick, and we're flying, and, and as we, we, you know, as we're about to come in for landing, the pilot comes on and says, hey, we're coming in for landing, and, and you know, it looks sunny, I mean, I wasn't paying any attention. And then we go into this really dark clouds. I mean, just turned dark. And the plane started bumping like this and bumping and bumping. And you know, I'm looking out the window for like, where's the ground? Like looking for the ground, the ground. 
And then, then finally I could see the ground. I was like, oh, great, praise God. We got the ground and we're coming in for a landing and we're literally 50 meters from touching down and he hits the gas and pulls up. And the plane screams back up and it's bouncing and bouncing and bouncing and bouncing and then breaks through the clouds and starts to circle. I was thinking down, um, why are we back up here again? And, and everyone on the plane is just kind of like a little sitting there quietly. And I was in kind of the, the bulkhead area with the stewardess facing. And you know, I'm, I'm kind of trying to register the level of fear on her face. <laughs> she seemed okay, calm. So we start circling. And we start circling 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour. So we're like two hours now circling. And after two hours, the pilot comes on again and says, so we're coming in for landing, you know, fasten your seatbelts. So we come in and it's kind of clear again, but when we come in, it just goes dark again. Completely dark, the plane is bouncing like this again. And then I'm looking for the ground again, we get close to the ground, okay, we're almost to the ground, 50 meters, 20 meters. He hits the gas and pulls up again. And this time this wall of hail starts to hit the plane, like pellets hitting the plane. And we're bouncing, 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 and then we come up through the clouds and we're in clear sky again. Starts circling again. And I asked the stress, has this ever happened to you? She's like, nope, first time. <laughs> it's like, that's not encouraging. <laughs> so we're circling probably another hour. It's been like three hours now we're in the air. Then the pilot comes on and says, oh, we're going to land in a different airport south of this city. So he flies around Moscow and we land at the airport south of the city. And I mean, when we landed, it's like everybody was clapping and cheering. It's like we won the Super Bowl or something. It's like everyone's fired up about that. And you know, sometimes when planes land, people kind of get up quickly. Some people still sit there. But this time, everybody stood up, grabbed their bags, were ready to get off this plane. And we're standing there 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes and nobody's saying anything, we're just standing there. And the pilot comes on and says, we're actually not gonna unboard, we're just refueling. We're gonna fly back to the other airport. I'm like eyeing the emergency exit, like could I jar that thing open? And I mean, you should have seen the, the level of enthusiasm just, and everyone just sat down. And I kid you not, this was Aeroflot, so they started to pass out cups of vodka to everybody. <laughs> Which, you know, I'm a Christian, so I didn't do that, but it was tempting. <laughs> Passed out the vodka, we're sitting there for another 30 minutes, they refuel, and we take off. And the steward says, oh, it'll be like 15 minutes, we'll just go up to the other side. Now, the, the, the turbulence got so bad, the actual cockpit door jar opened. So we're flying back up to the other airport, and we're circling again, and then we go through these clouds, and I mean, there was lightning everywhere. Out of the left side of the plane, the right side of the plane. I mean, it was just scary. And then after about an hour, they finally brought it in for a landing. So I, we landed at midnight when I took off at five in the afternoon. It was a seven hour flight altogether. Now the reason I'm telling you the story is not to make you wanna fly on Aeroflot or anything. <laughs> How would you feel if the pilot would have come on after three hours and said, uh, dear passengers, um, this is going way longer than I thought. I did not anticipate the bad weather. I'm tired and I'm done. I will no longer fly this plane. This is not what I signed up for. You guys take it on from here. What would be your reaction to that? I'd be sitting in the row, I said, hey, pilot guy, land the plane. No, nope, no, nope, too much lightning, too scary, too much stress. I, I don't want this, I don't, I don't need this. I, I, I'm paid for two hours, I'm not doing three, I'm not, I'm not. Hey, pilot guy, sit back down, land the plane. My life depends on you landing the plane. I wish it didn't, but it does. So sit down and land it. It's not just about you. There's too much at stake. Amen, church? Yes. That's a good message for me. 
Because sometimes I get in my bumpy plane and I think, I've done enough. I didn't sign up for this. I didn't sign up for that. I didn't sign up for that person. I didn't sign up for Chernobyl. I didn't sign up for that brother than being critical. I didn't sign up for, I didn't, I didn't sign up for COVID. I didn't sign up for this Zoom thingy. I'm done. You guys lay in the plane. Hey, Sean, sit back down. Lay in the plane. Lay in the plane. And the good news is, is that Jesus is actually the pilot. And trust me, he, he's not going to let the plane wreck. Jesus is the pilot. He will land the plane. Now, it will be bumpy, I promise you. And if you think you've been through the thick of it, it's still coming. But I guarantee you one thing, jumping out of the plane at 10,000 feet, not a good option. I don't see that ending well for anybody. Stay in the plane. Let Jesus land your... Jesus is in control. Amen, Amen church? Amen. Let's take communion. And as we take communion, let's just remember the power of God's word and how much God loves us and how much Jesus has done for each one of us. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for this time that we could spend with the open Bible and just be encouraged and inspired by the depth and the love and the wisdom that pours out of your scriptures every time we read it. Thank you, Father, that it's not just instructions, but it's this incredible love letter that expresses how since the beginning of time, you've thought of us and loved us and wanted us to be with you. Thank you for the home you've built for us in heaven. Thank you for uh, the, the house you've made for us. Thank you that our names are written in your book. Father, thank you that we can be saved. Father, I pray for every one of our hearts, for those who are just visiting and maybe the Bible is new for us, Father, that we can just study the Bible and learn from the Bible and, and let it change our worlds, our lives, and give us direction so that the GPS will always get us to heaven no matter where we are located right now. Father, because we do want to be with you. As we take the bread and the wine, help us to rem remind ourselves of the life Jesus lived. May we clothe ourselves in his life and let us remember as we drink the juice the unlimited mercy and grace that's been poured out and that all of our sins are forgiven. We love you and we thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.